from Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ralph Steedler, Johnny. Delta Liability. Oh, hiya, Ralph. What's on your mind? Poetry, you Philistine. Hmm? The bard's immortal words. Which words? Full fathom five thy father lies. Of his bones are corals made. And those... Those are pearls that were his eyes. Yeah. <laughs> What's the case, Ralph? Robbery? A pearl necklace? Uh, life insurance. $75,000 worth of bones down on the bottom of the deep blue sea. Or so they say. So who say? The insured's wife. The insured's best friend. Oh, they're quite positive about it. But you're not, is that it? Johnny, if I'm going to be stuck for 75 Gs, at least I ought to get the straight dope, shouldn't I? All right, I'll get it for you. Give me the who and where. It happened in Miami Beach. Check with the DA's office there. The insured was a man named William Markey. And the beneficiary? His wife, poor wretch. Oh, you're biased, Ralph. Sure, I'm paying alimony. So look it over, Johnny, and keep in touch. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Delta Liability, Hartford, Connecticut... The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Fathom 5 matter. Item 1, $143.40. Transportation, tips, and incidentals, Hartford to Miami. Purpose of assignment, aside from a chance to get a look at the sun, to check into the death of one William Markey, or to find out if there was a death, and how it happened, and where was the body, and if not, why not, and if so, how? Or rather, to determine... Well, anyway, the deputy investigator from the DA's office, a man named Barney Wilson, was at least as confused as I was. And he'd had a two-day head start. Now, we're going on the assumption, of course, that the man is dead. But legally, you understand, the fact hasn't yet been established. Meaning exactly what, Mr. Wilson? Well, it's pretty strong evidence, but no corpus delicti. Not so far, anyway. Maybe you'd better start at the beginning. And that would be where, Mr. Donner? How much do you know about the case? Well, uh, very little. Mm -hmm. The dead man, if he is dead, was named William Markey. He was uh, 46 years old, owner of a consulting engineering firm in New York. Mm -hmm. He'd been married to his present wife for three years. Her age is 30, Mm -hmm. and she's the beneficiary of his insurance. And, I might add, a charming and lovely young woman. They've been down here for about a month. And three days ago, Markey was killed, or allegedly killed, in an accident. That's right. Drowned, as I understand it, when a fishing launch sank a mile or two offshore. And then... Well, you can take it from there, Mr. Wilson. Now, your responsibility in the case is primarily to the insurance company. Is that right, Mr. Donner? Entirely, not primarily. Why, what do you mean? And it would be to the company's advantage if Markey's death were not legally established, huh? (laughs) They wouldn't have to pay the claim, if that's what you mean. Then it's reasonable to suppose, since the whole case is... uh pretty vague at present, that your efforts will be devoted to creating doubts as to whether Markey is really dead. Mr. Wilson, I think it's reasonable to suppose that I can't very well answer your questions without knowing exactly what has happened. Uh Well, all right, then. Briefly, this is it. Apparently, Markey came down here to bid on a construction job, a manufacturing plant. We didn't get the job, but he stayed on, he and his wife and the young fellow that was with him. What young fellow? Name of Danny Haynes. He worked for Markey, a draftsman, an engineer. Evidently a personal friend of the Markey's. Oh. The three of them took a house down the beach south and spent all the time together, nightclubbing one thing and another. I see. Anyhow, well, three days ago, Markey and young Haynes went out fishing together, hired a charter boat, a small cabin cruiser named the Fathom Five, and headed south along the coast, working the offshore banks. Whose idea was the trip? Markey's, according to young Haynes... In fact, all the rest of the story is according to Haynes. Nobody else saw what happened. And what did happen? Well, Haynes says they anchored off the reef and both of them fished from the dinghy for a while. Then Markey decided he'd go back to the cruiser and fix some breakfast. Mm -hmm. Haynes put him aboard and took the dinghy out alone. He says he fished along the reef for about 30 minutes before he looked back and saw the cruiser was afire. It was nearly a mile away, according to his story... 
And by the time he got back, the boat was a pillar of flame. He didn't see any sign of Marky? No, he says not. He couldn't get aboard because of the flames, and uh, a few minutes later, the cruiser sank. Mm -hmm. No one else saw it? There were no other boats around? No, no. It was early morning, and there weren't many others out. It had rained during the night, and there was a fairly heavy fog. They were only a mile and a half or so offshore, so Haynes rode in with a dinghy and reported it. Mm -hmm. Tell me, what was the depth of the ocean where the cruiser sank? Oh, it was only about 50 feet. I've got a salvage company working now to raise it. Get a diver down? Yes, but he didn't find out much. He couldn't get inside the hold. That's about the size of it, huh? Mm-hmm, it is. Until they get that cruiser raised so we can take a look at it. And, of course, it may not tell us a thing. Yeah. What about the currents along the reef where that boat went down? Oh, they're pretty bad. Strong and erratic. A body could be carried through the reefs and on out to sea and never be found. Well, I was uh, thinking more of the possibility of a good swimmer getting into shore. You said they were anchored only a mile and a half out. Yes, well, it's possible, but not very probable. He'd have been seen by Haynes or somebody else. There was a heavy fog, wasn't there? Mm Mm-hmm, fairly heavy. And, of course, Haynes could be lying. Maybe he did see him. I said it was possible. But that's not the line I'm planning to take, Mr. Dollar. So I get it. They'll bring that hull to the surface sometime tomorrow. Now, maybe we'll have some evidence then. Or maybe Marky's body will turn up in the next 48 hours. And if not? Then, Mr. Dollar, I will petition the probate court to declare him legally dead. I suppose you've got some reason for all this, Rush. Yes. I want the fact of death established in order to file a murder charge. Danny Haynes. Who else? It's the old, old story, isn't it? Two men go out and only one comes back. Unwitnessed accident. Nothing new about it. No, no. And it's never been an easy one to prove. Well, it'll be a lot tougher a year from now if you people put up a fight and force the decision up to the Superior Court. Suppose Haynes himself fights it. I wish he'd try. It'd be the next thing to an admission of guilt. Oh, Mrs. Markey, she has legal status in the case. She could do it, but she won't. Yeah, you're probably right. She wouldn't be likely to throw away $75,000. Well, I can't tell you what we'll do yet, Mr. Wilson. I'll have to look around first, talk to the people involved, get my feet on the ground. Mm-hmm. Fine. Well, you just do that. Here, I'll give you the addresses. Oh, good. Mrs. Markey's still at the beach house. Young Haynes has moved into a hotel near there. All right, thanks. Say, how did the three of them get along during the month they've been here? Like peas in a pod, from all appearances. Of uh, course, what was going on behind the scenes might have been another story. <laughs> it usually is. I think that's where we'll find the motive. Not that Mrs. Markey encouraged Haynes at all. She's a fine woman. I know, and she's beautiful. And this is the South. How's that? So long, Mr. Wilson. I'll keep in touch. (laughs) Expense account item two, $3.35. Telegram to Hartford requesting an investigation of the Markey firm's financial status both currently and over the past three years. And a similar check of Markey's personal financial status. Item three, $4.10, taxi to the Pompano Beach Hotel to talk with the DA's prime suspect, Danny Haynes. Look, Mr. Dollar, I've been over the whole thing with the police a half a dozen times. I'd still like to ask you a few questions, if you don't mind. They've got the whole story, all I know about it. They had a stenographer to take it down. Why don't you go to them with your questions? Mm, Maybe I got different questions. I told them everything I know about it. Look, Danny, you don't have to talk to me, but if you're smart, you will. Why so? Because the police already have their minds made up? Or at least Barney Wilson has. Sure. He's out to prove I killed Mr. Markey. Well, look, my mind isn't made up yet, so you can't lose anything by talking to me. Unless, of course, you did kill him. It happened exactly the way I told him. All right, what do you want to know? How long did you work for Markey? Two years. Did you get along with him all right? Sure. It was a good job, no complaints. You got to be pretty close personal friends, I understand. Well, I used to go to their apartment in New York once or twice a week for dinner, drinks. And then the three of you came down here together on a vacation. It wasn't a vacation. Mr. Markey came down to bid on a job. Did he need you along for that? Well, he thought there might be some sketches or plans to draw up. And were there? Well, no. As it turned out, they weren't necessary. Hmm. Funny, Markey wouldn't know that ahead of time, being an engineer. Well, actually, it was sort of Edna's suggestion of Mrs. Markey, I mean. I see. Yeah, now I see. Now, look, don't get the idea there's been anything between us. She's been swell to me. She's... 
Well, she's just wonderful, that's all. All right, all right. So the three of you came down on business, and within a few days, the job contract was awarded to another firm, but you still stayed on for three more weeks. That was Marky's idea. I don't know why exactly. I know he'd counted a lot on getting that job, but I was getting a free vacation. Why should I argue? So all of you just relaxed and lived it up, huh? Yeah, that's about it. Mr. Marky, too? No apparent worries on his mind? Well, he was moody sometimes. Went off by himself. But that wasn't too unusual. He was like that quite a lot. He and his wife seem to be getting along, all right? Sure. As far as I noticed, why? Well, let's talk about that accident for a minute, Danny. Whose idea was it to go on the fishing trip? Mr. Markey's. He woke me up at five in the morning, said he'd already phoned and hired the boat. The Phantom Five? Yeah, the same one we'd had a couple of times before. Mm -hmm. Well, I wasn't much for it. It was misting out with a heavy fog, but he was real hot on the idea, and... I couldn't very well argue he was the boss. Was Mrs. Markey up when you left? No, but she knew we were going. She'd packed a lunch. I guess they talked about it the night before. All right, she took the boat out then and followed the reef south. And what happened? Well, we anchored as close as we could get to the reef and went out in the dinghy for about an hour. No luck at all. Then Mr. Markey decided he'd go back on board and fix something to eat. Mm -hmm. I let him off and then rowed back along the reef. I figured as long as I'd had to come, I might as well try for a strike or two at least. And a while after that, I looked back and saw the cruiser was on fire. Was it still foggy then? Yeah, about the same. I could just see the glow. I couldn't even be sure what it was until I got close. I tried to get on board, but the flames were too high. I kept yelling, but there was nobody around. And you didn't see or hear any sign of Marky? No, I guess he was already dead. Then, not more than five minutes later, the cruiser sank. Yeah. Danny, do you have any theory as to what caused the fire? Well, it was a hot plate on board... A gasoline pressure rig. It was an old one in pretty bad shape. We'd talked about it before. I think it may have leaked into the bulkheads in the bilge. And when Mr. Markey went to light it to fix breakfast, the whole boat just went up in flames. I see. Tell me something, Danny. Do you think Markey could have committed suicide? Suicide? Why? For what reason? Oh, maybe losing that contract. You said it was pretty important to him. Or maybe he thought he was losing his wife. What do you mean? Well, maybe he misinterpreted your friendship with her, Danny. You're crazy. You're in love with her, aren't you? That's my business. I told you there was nothing between us. All right, all right. But did Marky know that? Look, you're the same age she is, and he was 15 years older. A man like that might get to wondering... Knock it off, Dollar. Nobody's private life is going to be dragged into this. You better stop and think, Danny. While you've still got time. A defendant in a murder trial doesn't have any private life. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a lady weeps, a lover curses, and a strange grim relic is brought up from the sea. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Barney Wilson, Mr. Dollar, special deputy with the DA's office. I understand you talked to Danny Haynes. You've got a good grave mind, Mr. Wilson. Oh, tolerable. Well, what do you think? Well, I'll go about six to five. He hasn't murdered anybody. Oh, uh-huh. well, that's close to even money. So you're not too sure, huh? No, I'm not too sure. But then I'm not even sure yet that Marky is dead, remember? Well, maybe we can settle that question this evening. What do you mean? The salvage boys have finally got grapple lines on that boat. They figured to bring it up to the service around 8 o'clock. I'm going out in one of the harbor launches. You'd like to come along? My company's got a 75 grand stake in this. Sure, I'd like to come along. All right. You meet me at Harbor Police Headquarters at 7.30. I'll be there. Good. I'll introduce you to the late William Markey. Somehow, I sort of doubt that, Mr. Wilson.
Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Delta Liability, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Phantom Five matter. Location, Miami, Florida. Expense account continued. Item six, $3.85. Taxi fare to the Markey Beach House, occupied for the past three days now by his wife since William Markey's accidental death. According to all reports, a very beautiful woman. The reports were correct. Won't you come in, Mr. Dollar? Thank you. Come this way. I've been practically living in here in the study since... I just haven't had the heart to even look at the rest of the house. Yes, I uh, I imagine it's been quite a shock for you, Mrs. Markey. Yes, terrible. No one knows. Sit down, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. I, uh, I really don't know very much about these matters. If there are papers to sign, maybe I should have a lawyer or something. No, that won't be necessary for the present. There's nothing to sign. But aren't you with the insurance company? I'm working for them at the moment as a special investigator. Oh. I'm to supply them with a full report of your husband's accident. They have to have that before they can do anything about paying off the policy. Well, couldn't the police give you all that? And there's a Mr. Wilson, I think his name is, who's with the district attorney. I've talked to Mr. Wilson. He's cooperating in every way possible. But uh, some of the details I have to get from you. Have you talked with Danny Haynes? Yes. Well, didn't he tell you what happened? He gave me a statement, yes. But only covering the details he actually knew about. Well, I'm sure there's nothing I can add, Mr. Dollar. I, I wasn't even there, as you know, of course. I know, Mrs. Markey. I'll get all of those details elsewhere. But then I don't see why you've well, come out uh, here. Well, I'd, I'd like to know a few things about your husband. Things you'd know better than anybody else. Uh, his actions and behavior during the last few weeks. His uh, mental attitude. I see. You think maybe he committed suicide, is that it? I don't think anything. I'm just trying to find out. But that's what you're driving at. Suicide. It's a possibility, of course. And, of course, your company isn't liable, I suppose, if it's oh, suicide. it'd still be liable, but only to the extent of $25,000 under the particular terms of the policy, not 75000 I see. Is that all, Mr. Dollar? I don't think you do see. Look, I'm not claiming it was suicide. I, I have no reason to think it was. But these questions are going to be raised by the claims board when they meet to consider settlement. And they're not going to pay out any money until they have the answers. So that's why I'm here, Mrs. Markey, to get those answers ahead of time. Now, you can help or you can hinder. But I think you ought to realize that you'll be mainly hindering yourself. It was not suicide. Bill wasn't that kind. You didn't know him. I resent your implication, Mr. Dollar. He'd never do a thing like that. I said I have no reason to believe that he did. Uh, please forgive me. I guess I'm sort of living in a state of shock. I'm not like this, really. Suspicious, belligerent. Well, sure, I understand, and I'm, I'm sorry to have to bother you this way, but there are certain questions... I know, I know. These things have to be done. It's all right. Would you like a drink, Mr. Dollar? Mm, not unless you're having one. Yes, I think I would like something. In that case, I'll have a scotch on the rocks, please. Oh, here, let me fix them. Thank you. Make mine the same. I guess it was the mention of suicide that set me off. Bill and I were married for three years. We were completely happy every minute of it. Nobody in the world had less reason than Bill to do a thing like that. What about financial problems? None that I knew about. Did you work before your marriage, Mrs. Markey? I was an entertainer. Chorus? Yes. I suppose that gives you the usual impression. <laughs> well, do I seem like a visiting fireman? No, but... Now, I just thought you might have been a dancer because you carry yourself so well. Lithe and graceful. Well, I, I've been away from it for quite some time. Well, it doesn't show. Here's your drink. Thank you. Maybe it'll help me relax a little. I think it might. Uh, tell me, Mrs. Markey, how did your husband and young Haynes get along? Well, that should be obvious. We brought him down here with us. Had him living here in the house for a month. But I, uh, I understood that was primarily your idea. Who said that? Did you suggest bringing Haynes along, or was it your husband? Well, I... I might have. I don't remember how it came up now, but Bill was all for it. 
Otherwise, he'd have put his foot down. Any possibility that he resented Haynes' presence but kept it to himself? Of course not. Why should he? I don't know. Well, if you're trying to imply something... I'm not. I'm just asking. I understood your husband had spells of brooding during the last few weeks, and I was trying to find out the reason for it. If he did, I'm sure I didn't notice it. What are Danny Haynes' feelings towards you? I think you're pretty insulting. I wasn't intending to be. Well, what would you call it? Just another routine question. I wasn't meaning to imply that you encouraged him in any way. I certainly didn't. But he's young, impetuous. You're very attractive. Maybe he cooked up crazy notions without any encouragement. He thought of me as a friend, that's all. No attitudes on his part that your husband might have misinterpreted. I don't believe I care to answer any more questions like these, Mr. Dollar. Look, I'm not just asking them for my own pleasure, Mrs. Markey. I'd a lot rather not ask them, but... But I've got a job to do. Well, I fail to see why it's necessary to probe into our private lives. All right, I'll tell you why. Your husband supposedly died out there beyond the surf when a cruiser burned and sank. What do you mean, supposedly? His body hasn't been recovered, so at present the evidence of his death is purely circumstantial. In fact, there isn't much evidence one way or another. But who could possibly doubt him? The insurance company will doubt it, Mrs. Markey. And they'll hold up processing any claim for payment until one of two things happens. Until I turn up sufficient proof of death to convince them, or until a court declares your husband legally dead. I didn't realize... Barney Wilson from the DA's office, for reasons of his own, is going to file for an immediate court decision. I'm pretty sure of that. It's... But as things stand now, my company will fight it. And with no more evidence than Wilson has, they'll be able to fight it successfully. But all those questions, what was the point? What were you driving at? Your husband's death had to result from one of three possible causes. One, an accident. Two, suicide. Three, murder. Murder? But there, there was... There was no one with him except... Do you mean Danny? That's one possibility. One out of three. Oh, no. I have no reason at the moment to give it any more weight than the other two. But there is one thing certain, Mrs. Markey... In view of the circumstances, not one cent of insurance is going to be paid until one of those causes is proved. But what can I do? I don't know anything about it. Maybe you don't. Or maybe there's something you've forgotten, don't think is important. Or something you haven't wanted to talk about. I don't know, of course. But it might be worth thinking about. It was nearly dark when I left the house, and I wouldn't have noticed the man standing under a palm tree by the driveway if he hadn't made a sudden move to get out of sight. Then when I walked toward him, he scurried out of the drive and slipped into a car parked at the street. I could see it was an old model, but I couldn't identify the make. I caught the last three numbers on the license plate before it disappeared around a bend. I couldn't quite figure it. It might have been Haynes, or some ghoulish swindler who was scared off when he saw the widow wasn't alone. The numbers were 642. Expense account item seven, three dollars and seventy-five cents. Taxi back to my hotel. Item eight, six dollars and a quarter. Dinner and incidentals there. And item nine, a dollar and forty cents. Taxi again to the waterfront headquarters of the harbor police. Thirty minutes later, I was in a police launch with Deputy Agent Barney Wilson, several miles down the coast, skimming across the water toward a bright cluster of spotlights where a salvage barge was working into the night to raise the burned hulk of the charter cruiser Fathom Five. You still got your mind set the same way, Mr. Dollar? What way was that? That there hasn't been any death or any murder? Oh, come now, Mr. Wilson. You're mistaking an honest scientific skepticism for a set of mine. Well, that's very pretty, Mr. Dollar. What does it mean? Well, I haven't taken any definite position yet. But I've got to see more evidence before I'll consider proof of death to be established without a question. That means you'll file a demur against a declaration by the courts, huh? It's not up to me. It's up to the company. But I can tell you right now that if you petition, they'll move to block it. You have no real evidence, Mr. Wilson. I'm getting it, though, piece by piece. The sea is starting to give up its prey, Mr. Dollar. What do you mean? The boys found his shoe late this afternoon, washed up in the surf, just about where you'd expect to find it if it had been carried in by the current. Identifiable? From the same New York shop that Marky's other shoes came from. Same size, same style. Well, it's something, all right. But it's still not conclusive. Who would he ask that Marky walks up and tells you he's dead? No. No, I guess I'd settle for just seeing him that way. Oh, by the way, I wonder if you could have an auto license checked for me. A partial license on a used car. Florida plates. The last three numbers are 642. Well, that might take a while with no more than that to go on. Well, I've got an idea the car may have been purchased within the last three weeks or so. Maybe that'll narrow it down. 
You got an idea it may mean something? Look, I have no idea at all. I'm just playing the hunches. But it's about time something in this case started meaning something. We edged the launch up the side of the barge, tied up to a stanchion, and climbed on deck. The power winches on the derricks were still grinding away, and the sunken hull of the burned cruiser was nearing the surface. A crew of men waited with salvage pontoons, ready to float the supporting cradle into place as soon as the waterlogged hulk was raised. Wilson and I stood by the rail, watching, not talking, wondering, I suppose, what answers the wreck might supply us with. The taut steel cables inched their way slowly up from the depths, and finally the boat itself broke the surface of the water. Then the men moved in with the pontoons, and other crew members dropped a suction hose into the water-filled hull and started a pump to empty. Finally, the whole thing was high enough so we could see that the cabin and the deck were badly burned, almost destroyed. But strangely enough, the hull itself seemed to be undamaged. Then Wilson and I both noticed something at the same time, a solid column of water spotting from a round hole near the keel of the boat, and we both realized what it meant. Look, Dollar! Look there. Somebody opened the seacocks. Somebody left them wide open. So one thing is certain. It wasn't an accident. She was sunk deliberately. That's exactly what I've been trying to tell you right from the start. Huh? William Markey was murdered. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a photograph, a silver cup, a harried widow, and the dead begin to stir with life. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Bonnie Wilson, DA's office. Oh, morning, Mr. Wilson. Say, you're on an expense account, aren't you? That's right. Good, I'm not. How about buying me a lunch? You got a deal. Twelve o'clock here at my hotel? Sold. Found any more shoes? No, and no bodies. Not yet, anyway. I'm amazed. Did find one thing you may be interested in, though. What's that? We got a lead on that license number you gave me last night. You were right. The car was bought from a dealer about two weeks ago. By whom? Somebody named John Smith over on the east side of town. That figures. Well, maybe here's something that won't. I checked the address this morning. And you know what? Sure, a vacant lot. Well, now, how the devil did you know? See you at lunch, Mr. Wilson. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, Miami Beach, Florida. To the home office, Delta Liability, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Fathom Five matter. A sunken cruiser that refused to give up its dead. <laughs> Item 10, $4.80, lunch with D.A. Deputy Barney Wilson. A man who'd made up his mind about the case before I'd even arrived in town. Murder, he'd called it. When the hired cruiser, Fathom Five, burned and sank mysteriously a mile or two offshore. But nobody had been found yet, and I still doubted very much that one ever would be. Because I wasn't even certain that William Markey was dead. Wilson, of course, had different ideas. 
Yes, so, Mr. Dollar? It's the old, old story. Two men go out in a boat, and only one comes back. No witnesses, nothing. And if that doesn't indicate murder, I... Say, pass the sugar, will you, please? Sure, here. You're convinced it's murder, and you're convinced young Danny Haynes did it. Well, who else? Well, now, that would be a fine argument to advance in court, wouldn't it? Sure, sure. Certain conviction. Simply because you can't produce any other suspect. Wilson, I don't think there's been any murder at all. Now, you can pass me the sugar. All right. Suppose you let me tell you how I figure it. While I'm eating my dessert? Marky and his wife took a liking to this Haynes kid and practically made him one of the family. And right there was their mistake. It usually is. Because Haynes started getting ideas about his boss's wife. You have to admit, Mrs. Marky is a mighty pretty woman. Who could deny it? She's Haynes' own age, and her husband was older. So the kid in that bird brain of his figured he had it all tagged. Figured she actually went for him. I think he probably started bothering her, making a nuisance out of himself. And I'll lay you odds she'll admit he did, once she's convinced he's guilty. Well, I got a sneaking hunch you may be right on that. Oh, thank you, thank you. So what happened? Marky finally noticed the kid was getting a little out of line. Probably didn't even take it seriously at first, but eventually he must have decided he'd better get Haynes straightened out. So, he took him out on that fishing boat in order to talk to him alone, is that it? Mm-hmm. No, you're with a dollar. But the thing backfired. Haynes probably got mad. Maybe started a fight, knocked Marky out, and that gave him his big idea. Spur of the moment, huh? Yes, sir. Now, with the boss out of the way, he'd have a clear field with the widow. So he threw Marky overboard, set fire to the cruiser, opened the seacock so it would be sure and sink, and then rowed away in the dinghy. And how could he be sure the body wouldn't be found, washed ashore by the currents? Oh, he couldn't be sure. But what if it was? There was a heavy fog. Nobody saw what happened. He knew it would be mighty tough to prove anything on him. Oh, brother, that's an understatement. As a matter of fact, it'll be impossible to prove that story. Yeah, well... Once he's arrested and interrogated, I figure he'll break down and tell us the whole thing. Not unless he's completely simple-minded. No, you haven't even got the shadow of a case, Mr. Wilson. All you've got is a wild theory that doesn't even fit the facts. You've got a better theory, I suppose. I think so. And would it be the kind that would take your company off the hook on that $75,000 life insurance policy? Now, by coincidence, it just so happens that it would. In fact, that insurance policy is the key to the whole thing. Uh Uh-huh. I sort of thought you might say that. I didn't have any pet theory at first, but I do now. I'm pretty sure this thing is an out-and-out insurance fraud, and Danny Haynes is being used as the fall guy. Oh, do tell. And what are you finding for evidence, Mr. Dollar? Oh, a lot of little things that are sort of starting to add up. For one thing, I got a long telegram this morning from a firm of confidential investigators in New York. I forwarded a request through Hartford yesterday. Yeah, they turned up quite a lot on Marky. Such as? His financial status for the main thing. Oh, well, go on. Well, when he and Mrs. Marky were married three years ago, the firm was in first-class shape. But they've been living high, living up his capital. If he'd got that contract he came down here after, it, well, it might have pulled him through. But he didn't get it. And that result, he was flat broke. So what? A lot of people are broke. But not many of them have a $75,000 policy. Uh, I thought that's what you were getting at. What I am getting at is what I think happened. And I think Danny Haynes is telling the truth. I think Marky did send him off alone in that dinghy. Then Marky fired the boat, opened the seacocks, and while she filled up and sank, he swam ashore in the fog. And he's waiting it out somewhere now until his widow collects the insurance. Well, I don't see where you've got any more evidence than I have. Well, there's not much, I'll grant you. Not so far. But what there is adds up. I guess I'm just stupid, Dollar. All right, look. Take Mrs. Markey's attitude, for instance. She's trying hard to play the role, but it doesn't come off. Now, does she act to you like a four-day widow? Well, she's got a lot of self-control. I'll say she has. I tried to go to her yesterday when I talked to her. Came right out and practically insulted her. And how did she react? Never took her eyes off that main chance, the 75000 Well, you know, it's not exactly unheard of for a widow not to mind too much being a widow. Oh, no, no, that's not the impression she gives. She's tense enough, nervous as a cat. But it's not because of grief or any feeling of relief, either. 
It's because she's afraid she might say the wrong thing and let her foot slip. Well, everybody's got to write their own opinion. Another thing is that Marky's body hasn't turned up. Now, I talked to the harbor master this morning. He knows the currents along this coast backwards and forwards. He says it's the only one chance in a hundred that Marky's body would have been carried out through the reef instead of thrown up on the beach about where you found that shoe. So this is the one time in a hundred. That was a mighty fine lunch, Mr. Dollar. We're going to fight you, Mr. Wilson. If you petition the court to declare Marky legally dead. Yes, I sort of figured you would. Hensley and Davis phoned me this morning and said you'd retain them as counsel. That's right. Well, I've been fought before. Expense account item 11, 10 cents. Phone call to Edna Markey, widow of the allegedly deceased and beneficiary of his insurance policy. Hello? Mrs. Markey? Yes? This is Johnny Dollar. Oh. Oh, I didn't recognize your voice. I wonder if I could ask a favor of you. Well, if it's something I... I'd like to borrow a photograph of your late husband for a few hours. Well... I'll take good care of it and make sure it gets back to you. Well, the fact is I really don't have one. Oh, well, uh, you must have forgotten. I, I noticed one yesterday afternoon on the mantel in your study. Well, I, I meant not a good one. Well, that one will do fine, and thanks a lot. Uh, has uh, something new come up, Mr. Dollar? Yes, yeah, you might say that. I'll send a messenger out to pick it up. Goodbye, Mrs. Markey. <laughs> Item 12, $3.80, messenger service. Item 13, $1.90, taxi fare to the used car lot of one truthful Tom, the dealer who'd sold a car to a man named John Smith, a car that had departed suddenly from the vicinity of the Markey Beach House when its driver saw me come out of the house. I wasn't too sure whether Tom was truthful or not, but one thing was certain, he was typical. I notice you looking at that little gray job, friend, and I say to myself, truthful Tom, don't you go trying to get the best of that lad, because he's walked right in here and spotted the best dog gone by on the lot before he's even turned around. Well, I I wasn't really thinking of buying it. Friend, with the price I'll make you on that car, you can't afford not to buy it. No, no, I'm not really in the market. It's an economic society, friend. We're all in the market when the price is right. No, I just happened to notice that it looked like the car a friend of mine had stolen a few weeks ago. My dear friend, I'll make you... Uh, did you say stolen? Oh, it may not be the same one, of course. I've got papers on that car. I've got papers on every last car on this lot. Did you have papers on the one you sold to John Smith two weeks ago? If he says I didn't, he's a liar. Now, wait a minute, mister. And I can get a dozen witnesses to prove it. You remember him, then? Well, do you? Remember who? Look, I'm a special investigator for the Delta liability. It's a frame-up, that's all it is. Whoever it is says they got a hot car deal on this lot is lying. Truthful Tom never turned a dishonest penny in his whole doggone life. Good, and we'll forget it. And any low-down rat that says I did is a two-legged snake, and I... What'd you say? I don't care anything about your deals. I'm trying to locate a fellow who bought a car from you. Well, friend, uh, that puts a different light on it. Uh, John Smith, you said? That's the name he used. I can't say I recollect anybody by that name. Here's a copy of the title registry on the car. Let's see now. Six, eight, four, two, dark green. Oh, that was that old clunker that... Uh, of course, it was well worth the price I was asking. Do you remember the buyer? You bet your life. You know why? Because he paid cash. Not a check, cash. I mean, the real long green Missoula. Would you recognize the photograph of him? Well, I might if... Oh, is this it? Well, let's see now. Well... No doubt of it, friend. That's the lad, all right. Good evening, Mrs. Markey. Mr. Dollar. I brought back the photograph of your husband. Oh, there wasn't that much hurry about it. Did it help any? Quite a bit. Do you mind if I come in? Well, all right, of course. Thank you. You know, I've been trying to think all day long what you could possibly want with that picture. I still can't imagine. You can't, huh? Sit down, Mr. Dollar. Thanks. It's a terrible picture, of course. That's why I hesitated about giving it to you. Doesn't look a thing like him. It looked enough like him, Mrs. Markey. Enough like him? I don't think I know what you mean. Did you know your husband bought a second-hand car the week before his so-called death? You must be mistaken. He'd have told me about it. The car dealer positively identifies his photograph. He used the name John Smith, paid for it in cash. What did you mean, so-called death? 
William Markey isn't dead. I think we're both aware of that. Well, Mrs. Markey, aren't we... Do you mind telling me what you're talking about? It wasn't even a very smart scheme to start with. Your husband must have been really up against the wall, or he'd have known better than to try it. But I suppose he thought he had to in order to hang on to you. I imagine you're pretty expensive to support. I think you'd better leave right now. Actually, it would serve you both right if I did. But I decided to give you a chance. I came here to let you know exactly where you stand. And where is that, if I may ask? One step away from prison. Take that step and you're in up to your necks, you and your husband both. What step? So far, we have no case against you for attempted fraud because you haven't filed a claim yet. But take my advice, Mrs. Markey, don't file one, because the minute you do, we're going to hit you with both barrels. You've got some pretty crazy ideas, haven't you? You've had fair warning. I've had one of the biggest bluffs I've ever heard about. Why, you people would do anything, wouldn't you, to keep from paying off on a policy? Better talk it over with your husband before you do anything foolish. My husband is dead, Mr. Dollar. No one but you even doubts it. I'm a cynic. How much proof does it take to bring you to your senses? Mrs. Markey, as this case stands right now, there's only one way you could convince me that William Markey is not alive. Show me his dead body. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a crazy kid in love, a right decision by a court... And then the whole case smashes wide open. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar? Yes, just a moment. For you, Mr. Dollar. Thanks. Johnny Dollar. Barney Wilson here. Your hotel told me where to locate you. I'd rather you located that car. All the police agencies in the state have the license number and description. It'll turn up. Well, the sooner the better. It'll take more than a car to prove William Mark is still alive. The dealer who sold it to him identified his photograph. All right, but he bought the car two weeks ago. We know he was alive at that time. In case you've forgotten, Mr. Dollar, the Fathom Five sank only four days ago. That's when Markey was murdered. Okay, okay. We're not going to settle it by arguing. That's why I phoned. It's going to be settled tomorrow morning. You've petitioned for a hearing? Ten o'clock in Judge Campbell Chambers. You're making a mistake. See you in court, Mr. Dollar. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Miami Beach, to the home office, Delta Liability, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Fathom Five matter. The case of a cruiser mysteriously sunk off the Florida coast. I phoned the insurance company's legal counsel and told him that Wilson had petitioned a hearing to have William Markey declared legally dead. Then I rejoined Mrs. Markey in the study. She was tense and on edge, pacing the floor and smoking nervously. I watched her a moment without saying anything, fully aware of her beauty and appeal. And fully convinced also that she and her missing husband were trying to swindle my company out of $75,000 in life insurance. I felt a little sorry for Marky. She must have been a pretty expensive luxury for a man who was going broke. But then I stopped feeling sorry. I remembered that they'd tried to set up young Danny Haynes as the fall guy for murder. Well, why don't you go ahead and say it? Say what? Whatever it is you're thinking. I thought I'd already said it, and pretty bluntly, too. You made some wild accusations. Not so wild. I've got some fairly solid facts to back them up. Apparently the DA's office doesn't agree with you. 
Wasn't that Mr. Wilson on the phone? That's right. And didn't he say he would ask the court to declare my husband legally dead? He's going to try to, but we'll stop him cold. He hasn't got a leg to stand on. Well, that's what you're hired for, isn't it? To find some technicality so they can get out of paying off on a policy? Attempted fraud isn't exactly a technicality, Mrs. Markey. Now I'll repeat that advice I just gave you. Get in touch with your husband. Tell him the scheme is off. It won't work. And don't file a claim for that life insurance. You'd like that, wouldn't you? You'd just love to bluff me out of $75,000. No, no, I just kind of hate to see you go to prison, that's all. And that's exactly what is going to happen if you file that claim. You keep talking about some scheme. What scheme, Mr. Dollar? You want it laid right on the line, huh? I'd just like to know what you're talking about. And just how much I've figured out, all right. All right, I'll paint it for you in black and white. Your husband was broke, flat broke. I'm not guessing there. I got a report on him from a financial investigator in New York. I knew nothing about his business affairs. That I wouldn't know. Anyway, he thought he saw a chance to pull off a swindle on the basis of the only thing he had left, that $75,000 life insurance policy. So the two of you worked it out together. Did your financial investigator tell you that? Or would you be guessing? Your husband bought a car under an assumed name and probably rented living quarters somewhere in the area under another assumed name. So it was all set. It was just a matter of waiting for a morning when a heavy fog was down. (laughs) You have a fantastic imagination. Meantime, just in case the accident theory didn't go over, you kept playing young Haynes along so it would seem as though he had a motive for murder. And that part was a cinch. He was already halfway in love with you. You also have a rather nasty imagination. So finally, four days ago, conditions were just right. Your husband took Haynes out on that fishing trip in the Fathom Five. He anchored the cruiser and sent Haynes off along the reef in the dinghy. Then he set fire to the boat, opened the seacock so it would be sure to sink. He swam ashore and drove off in the car that he'd bought for exactly that purpose. As I understand it, Mr. Dollar, that cruiser was anchored a mile or two offshore. Are you actually suggesting my husband swam that distance? You mean that's something else you supposedly didn't know about? What? Oh, that report from New York was more complete than you seem to realize. William Markey has been a member of the Greenpoint Athletic Club for years. He won silver cups in the Long Island Sound Marathon Swim three different times. I knew he belonged to the club, of course, but I assumed it was more social. Of course he could swim that far. That particular talent was probably what gave him the idea for the whole thing. There's no proof, you know. Not one bit of real proof. There will be, if you try to collect that insurance. We'll turn up enough proof to reach all the way from here to the state prison. So if you try to... You excuse me, please. Yeah, sure. I'll be right back. I lit a cigarette and waited for her, wondering why I even bothered to come here. I was fed up with it, sick of the whole thing. Fraud cases are like that, messy and dirty. You see people with a mask down and you get a look inside. And you get to wondering if everybody's like that. Wondering if you'd be like that yourself, maybe, if the price were right. And if you are, you hope you never find it out. All I wanted at the moment was to leave the house, wind the thing up, and get out of town. I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar. It was somebody looking for an address. I mean, they had a wrong address. I see. Well, I think we at least understand each other now. Yeah, I'm sure we do. And I can say only one thing. You're wrong. You're completely and absolutely wrong. Maybe. I wish you weren't. I wish my husband were still alive, even under the circumstances you believe. Maybe I wouldn't be on the verge of a nervous breakdown, trying to hold on to my sanity. Maybe I wouldn't be crying alone at night. You have my deepest sympathy, Mrs. Markey, for everything you're going through. There's no use at all in trying to talk to you, is there? Not unless you care to tell me where to find your husband. Good night, Mr. Dollar. I left the house and turned down the dark road toward the Pompano Beach Hotel. I'd planned to pick up a taxi there, but after that unknown visitor came to Mrs. Markey's door, I'd made a slight change in the plans. Whoever it was hadn't been a stranger, that I was sure of. She'd been too nervous when she came back into the room. It was someone she hadn't wanted me to know about, and I was pretty certain I could guess who. Evening, Mr. Haynes. What? Oh. 
You're Mr. Dollar, the insurance investigator. Mind if I come in? Well, um... All right, sure. You, uh, weren't asleep, were you? No, I was, um... I was just reading. Been here all evening? Yeah, sure I've been here. Why? You haven't been out in the last half hour? I said I'd been here all evening. You weren't down the road at the Markey place a few minutes ago? No, I wasn't. Now, look. I've answered just about all the questions I'm going to, to you or to anybody else. So what are you trying to get at? What's the point? All right, forget it, Danny. Sure, forget it. It looks like you're out to try the same thing Wilson's doing, trying to tag me on a murder rap. And you're trying to drag Edna into it, Mrs. Markey. Oh, she told me how you talked to her last night. And I suppose you've been over there again this evening. Oh, relax, Danny. I'll tell you one thing right now. You better leave her alone and stop trying to push her around. She doesn't deserve it. She's had too much of that kind of stuff as it is. Oh? From whom, Danny? From Marky, that's from whom. She tell you that? I suppose you'll claim she's lying. You think everybody is lying. But you don't know her like I do. She's a sweet kid, Dollar, and she's had a raw deal out of life. Such as? Marky. The way he treated her, things he made her do. Oh, not when anybody would see it, pin it on him. He was too smart for that. But she told me about it. And there were plenty of times I could hardly keep from smashing him in the face. Oh, brother, she's got you really set up good. What do you mean by that? If you talk this way to Wilson at the DA's office for two minutes, he'd slap a murder indictment on you so fast it'd make your head swim. I didn't kill Marky. Hating a guy is one thing, but I didn't kill him. Yeah, I know, I know. Because he's still alive. Well, maybe he is. I don't know. All I know is what I saw out there that morning. And you saw only as much as he wanted you to see. Well, maybe so. But I'll tell you one thing. If he is trying to pull something crooked, he's doing it on his own. She's not in on it. It'd be a little hard for him to collect his own insurance, wouldn't it? Oh, well, maybe he figured to get it away from her afterward. I don't know what he might be planning on, but I know she's got nothing to do with it. She's a great girl. I've never known anybody like her before. No, I don't imagine you have. I'd lay down my life for her if it ever came to that. And I imagine that's exactly what they were counting on. Good night, Danny. <laughs> Expense account item 16, $1.90. Taxi fare the following morning from my hotel to the courthouse. I got there at 9.30 and went over the case with Jim Davis, local counsel for the insurance company. And at 10 o'clock, the hearing on Wilson's petition was open in chamber session, Judge A.G. Campbell presiding. Judge Campbell kept the proceedings informal, and the whole thing moved pretty fast. Both sides presented briefs, and additional evidence was introduced through verbal interrogation. No witnesses were called. By 10.30, the cases for both sides had been completed. Very well. There is no further evidence of fact or rebuttal. The court will make its decision on the evidence at hand. Now, in cases of this nature... Where it is requested that the fact of death be established by legal declaration, it has been generally held that the substantiating evidence for said request must be essentially unchallengeable. The precedents in law are too numerous to bother citing. Now, in the case we are considering here, it seems to the court that the substantiating evidence is far from unchallengeable. In point of fact, it would seem that the bulk of the evidence indicates that William Markey may indeed be still alive. Now, the court would be powerless to act even in the face of a reasonable doubt. And the contrary evidence here is a good deal stronger than a reasonable doubt. Therefore, in the matter of the request made herein that William Markey be declared legally dead, it is the court's decision that the petition not be granted. If new evidence becomes available at some future time, the petition may be resubmitted. The court is adjourned. Well, looks like you won, Mr. Dollar. I told you what would happen. I sure do hate to see that kid get away with murder. Now, forget it. Marky is walking around somewhere just as alive as you or I. Well, we've all got a right to our opinions, Mr. Dollar. I see he's floating around out there in the Atlantic somewhere. That's what he meant for us to think. Maybe so, but uh, I... Pardon me, Mr. Wilson, a message was phoned in for you, but they wouldn't let me in the courtroom. Oh, thank you, old man. Excuse me, Mr. Dollar? Sure. Go ahead and read it. 
Did I step out of that office, somebody's bound to start calling. Well, well. What's the matter? Mr. Dollar, the Coast Patrol hauled a man's body out of the surf about an hour ago. Been drowned. So? They got a quick check on his prints. It's William Markey. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a dead man tells a tale, but not the tale he was meant to tell. And thereby hangs the wind-up. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Barney Wilson here. All right, Mr. Wilson, I'm braced. Rub it in. Well, you were a little overconfident. Overconfident? Let's face it, I made a jerk of myself. After I apologize to you, I've got to crawl out there and apologize to Mrs. Markey. I wouldn't be too hasty about it. I've been putting it off for the last two hours. After the way I talked to her, I'd rather walk into a cage of lions and face her again. But I thought her husband was alive, and I thought she knew it. Then your boys have to go and pull his body out of the surf. Uh, Well, that's why I called. I had a tag for an out-and-out insurance fraud. Mr. Dollar, the way it looks right now, I don't know what it is. It was probably murder. What else? Look, if you want to lose your mind, you come on over here to the morgue. Why? What do you mean? Mr. Dollar, I've been a detective for 20 years, but I've never hit one before that was as crazy as this. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Miami Beach, to the home office, Delta Liability, Hartford, Connecticut... Assignment, the Fathom 5 matter. It happened to involve a 75,000 insurance policy. (laughs) Item 17, a dollar and 60 cents, taxi from my hotel to the county morgue. I couldn't figure what Wilson meant when the cruiser Fathom 5 burned and sank and William Markey's body wasn't found. I thought I'd spotted an attempted insurance swindle. I'd even warned Mrs. Markey not to try to file a claim. And then, a few hours ago, Markey's drowned body had been washed up on the beach. Wilson should be happy. He'd been proven right. But instead, he'd sounded more mixed up and uncertain than he'd been before. Good morning, Mr. Dollar. You know, you don't pick the pleasantest places in the world to hold conferences... I thought you might want to take a look at him. Though I'll be eternally blasted if I know what anybody could tell by looking. Well, there's the lad who's given us all the trouble, Mr. Dollar. William Markey, number 423. I never thought I'd see him here. I told Mrs. Markey that the only thing that would convince me he wasn't alive would be to see his body. All right, I'm convinced. And I'll never try to outguess an ocean current again. Everything seemed to add up to... Oh, now, wait a minute. Uh, I wondered how long it'd be before you noticed. Doesn't make sense. Like I said on the phone, this one is crazy. This was pulled out of the surf this morning? Right. 
And the cruiser sank five days ago. That's when Marky supposedly drowned. You're on the beam, Mr. Dollar. This body hasn't been in the ocean for five days. You win the four-day trip to Bermuda in a complete new wardrobe. Have you had an autopsy? Doc Morgan just finished it 20 minutes ago. That's why I called you. Doc wouldn't stick around himself. No, I think he went out to get drunk. How long does he think Marky has been dead? Not over 18 hours since sometime last night. Looks like we were both right. For whatever good it is, he was alive after the sinking, just like you claimed, and now he's dead, just like I claimed. What was the cause of death? Drowning. Only you haven't heard the real crazy part yet. Why? What do you mean? You remember we found one of his shoes washed in a couple of days ago? Yeah. The body was wearing two shoes when they pulled it out. They always make one slip, don't they? Uh, a couple in this case. Huh? It's the second one that nearly pushed Doc Morgan off his rocket. What second one? Marky was drowned, all right. But not in the ocean. Huh? It was fresh water in his lungs, not seawater. Was Morgan sure? Swore by it, and then at it. That's what threw him. Yeah, I imagine. When you get an 18-hour test on a man who's supposed to have been dead for five days and find fresh water when it ought to be salt... Well, I guess the late Mr. Markey can't tell us much of anything else. So, where do we go from here, Mr. Dollar? Good question. You haven't found the car yet, huh? The one Markey bought under an assumed name? No, no, but I give the boys an extra pride to bear down on it. Half the town force is out looking for it now. Wonder where he was hiding out for those four days. What I want to know is who killed him and how and why. Oh, the why is fairly easy. It's the who and how that carry the question marks. That fingerprint ID was certain, huh? There's not the slightest doubt of what this is, will you, Marky? Oh, you're looking for an easy way out, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, I guess I am at that. Well, then it looks like our number one is the lad you've been after all along. Young Danny Haynes, huh? What do you say we go and have a talk with him? Only one thing was wrong with the idea. It didn't work. Haynes wasn't in, and the clerk at his hotel said he hadn't seen him all day. The night clerk admitted that he'd slept through most of his shift and wasn't sure of anything. We searched Haynes' room and found nothing. So for the moment, we left it at that. Wilson put a stake out in the hotel and went back to his office. I went to my hotel and waited. Johnny Dollar. Barney Wilson. Yeah, what's up? We finally got a break. The boys found that car. Where? Parked at the curb out on the east side of town. May have been abandoned there, or it may be where Marky was hiding out. It's in front of an apartment house. Have they checked through it yet? No, they haven't touched it. I'm leaving to go out there now. Want me to swing by and pick you up? If you don't, I'll sue you. I'll meet you out in front of the hotel. We stopped a block away and walked up to the apartment house. The car was still parked at the curb, and the plain clothes man watching it said no one had been near it. We went on inside and found the landlady, identified ourselves, and started questioning her. Luck seems to still be with us. Well, you see, most of my guests are permanent, as you might say. Or at least as permanent as renters ever are. Yes, we understand. In fact, the only unit I've let in the last two months is number 14. That's up one flight with a pull-down bed. When did you rent that one? Well, let's see now. I think it was um, about ten days ago. He paid a month's rent in advance. He? What was his name? Uh, Mr. Jones, a very nice, quiet, middle-aged fella. He lived by himself? Oh, yes, and never went out much. After he moved in, that is. He didn't stay here for the first four or five days after he rented it. Until the night the Fathom Five sank. When did you see Mr. Jones last? Well, it's a funny thing. He went out yesterday evening and he didn't come back at all. What kind of a car did he drive? Oh, good heavens, I don't know. But you can look for yourself. It's parked out there at the curb. A friend of his brought it by a while ago. What? What's the friend's name? Why, I didn't ask him. He's an awful nice young fella. He said Mr. Jones was going on a trip and sent him to pick up his belongings. And he had Mr. Jones's key, so I decided it was all right. He's up there packing now. Twelve. Thirteen. Next door down there. Better take it easy. It's hard to tell what to expect. Right. Mm-hmm. He's in there, all right. Try the knob. Easy. It's locked. Then there isn't much choice. Who is it? Open up, Haynes. We want to talk to you. 
I said open up. Get away from that door. Watch it, Wilson. I'm warning you, don't try to come in. Well, we know now what to expect. I'll cover the door here, Dollar. You go down and tell Dave to cover the outside windows and call in for a couple of squad cars. Right. Hey, he's going out that window. There must be a fire escape. Come on, let's hit the door. <laughs> There he is, at the bottom of the fire escape. Hold it, Haynes! Stay back! All right, Haynes, it's up to you. Throw down that gun or I'll drop you. I'm sorry, kid. He's down. Yeah. That second shot was dead center. I know, I tried to hold low on him, but it jumped up on me. Well, he said he'd die for her if it came to that. It came to that. It was after dark when Wilson and I drove out to the Markey Beach House. There were no lights on and nobody answered the doorbell. So Wilson forced entrance and we shook the place down. We found evidence of a struggle in the study and in the bathroom. Water from the bathtub had overflowed behind the tile and was still seeping out along the baseboard. We found a dressing gown of Mrs. Markey stuffed in the back of a closet, soaking wet. Piece by piece, Wilson collected his evidence and the picture became more and more clear. He phoned in for a fingerprint crew and went on working. I left him there and went back into town to my hotel and took the elevator up to my room. Mr. Dollar. What are you doing here? Waiting for you. They've got extras out. They say the police shot Danny Haynes. I thought maybe you could tell me what it's all about. Sure. Sure. And what you mostly want to know is how much he talked before he died. Isn't that it, Mrs. Markey? I don't know what you mean. Then go on out to your house and ask Wilson. He's out there with a fingerprint crew. And I imagine he can tell you anything you want to know by now. I'd... I slipped up last night. I thought it was Haynes who came to your door. But it wasn't. It was your husband. And you told him to come back later. Then when I left, you called Haynes and had him come over. If he said that, he lied. I even gave you the idea for it myself. When I said the only thing that could convince me your husband wasn't alive would be to see his dead body. So you talked Haynes into helping you provide the evidence I said I'd have to have. My husband's body was found in the ocean. They told me that this evening. Yeah, but he didn't die there. He was drowned in the bathtub at your house, and you and Haynes did it. You're out of your mind. Danny Haynes was lying. Then go tell Wilson. It's his job now, not mine. Maybe you'll be able to convince him, but I doubt it. And I'm pretty sure you won't be able to convince a jury. You think not. I'll get the best lawyer money can buy. Yeah, you do that, Mrs. Markey. But don't plan on using any of that insurance money for it. Why not? Because there won't be any. That policy was already void when you and Haynes killed your husband last night. What? An attempted fraud cancels the policy the minute it's committed. In other words, Mrs. Markey, five days ago when your husband sank the Fathom Five and tried to play dead... I don't believe it. You've lost out all the way around, Mrs. Markey. Your husband, your boyfriend, your insurance claim. And now you stand a pretty good chance of losing your life. A four-time loser. That's really a record. <laughs> Expense account item 18, $321.60. Hotel and incidentals in Miami and transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $684.95. End of account, end of report. Remarks? You quoted a line of Shakespeare at the start of this case, Ralph. Full fathom five, thy father lies. Well, you're wrong. It turns out to be the widow who lies. And lies and lies. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, beginning next Monday night. Next week. Well, if I'd minded my own business, I wouldn't have heard the girl beg for help. And from that point on, I needed help. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, 
It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Mary Jane Croft, Barney Phillips, Carlton Young, Eleanor Audley, Sam Edward, Shep Menken, and John Daner. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs> <laughs>